guys actually have quite a bit of momentum given the general dismissal of this campaign in the yeah, national media. and you haven't seen anything yet, Alex, because everything we've done, I'm an entrepreneur and operator, we have done everything on the cheap. But thanks to Yang Yang, we raised $10 million last quarter, and you're going to see, after we have some resources to put to work, you're going to see us outperform the other campaigns and shock the world. How does Joe Biden only have $9 million and you're raising millions of dollars? What is that math about? Americans understand that we need to actually start solving the problems of the 21st century. You think it's the whole thing of like the no tie, the real talk, like that's what people want? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a politician, and so the fact that people can sense that I'm just like them, I'm a parent, like I'm not someone who's made a career in politics, and my interest in making a career in politics is moderately low. I'm for term limits. I think the fact that people make a career out of being in D.C. is not good for, for the country. If the Democratic primary in 2020 is similar to the Republican primary in 2016, it means that Andrew Yang we'll is Donald nominee. Trump and will be the nominee. Oh, well, Alex, one poll came out that said that I was one of the only candidates in the field that 10% or more of Donald Trump voters say they would support in the general. And the number one criteria that Democrats have for the nominee is beating Donald Trump. So when Dems realize that they have a candidate who can peel off hundreds of thousands of Trump voters and is one of the surest bets to beat him in 2020, that's when you'll see our poll numbers just climb and climb. Do you think you're going to be the Democratic nominee? Yeah, 100%. What doubts do you have? We have all of the pieces in place, and we've been doing everything on a shoestring this whole time. Uh, we're about to pour gas on the fire that is the Yang Yang. You know, Andrew, you being a Chinese-American and um, uh, U.S.-China relation, as you just mentioned, is uh, not that good at all. Uh, China is uh, both and increasingly so, both a bogus man and a real competitor, if not a fierce adversary. So you being Chinese-American running for the president of the United States, how does that cut it? Yes. So we have a running joke in the office about what Donald Trump's nickname will be for me. Um, and, we've, and, we've, and we've come up with Comrade Yang. You know, it's like, oh, Comrade Yang at it again. So, um, which will be a very good day for the campaign when he decides to give me a nickname. Uh, but, so I'm a very proud Chinese American, Asian American. I think that having someone like me on the national stage would actually be a very, very positive thing for the community on, on multiple levels. Uh, I, I certainly think that there's going to be some mistrust among some subset of Americans about like having an Asian American president, though I think after people spend some time with me, that does disappear. Uh, I've been to Iowa seven times. I'm going back for an eighth time to headline a progressive event called Progress Iowa, uh, uh, December 20th. And when I talk to the Democrats of Iowa and New Hampshire, there's zero concern about my ethnic background. Uh, if anything, the smart Asian guy actually tends to work pretty well um, because if I'm talking about technology and numbers and math, um, they're like, yeah, he sounds like you know, he knows what he's talking about. Like this guy's like, <laughs> this guy's definitely done his homework. Yeah, it's two plus two. But I, I do want to suggest a few things about having an Asian American run for president. Um, so we, we tend to be relatively structured and responsible as a community, um, but the presidency as Sandy pointed out before, may be an exception to how this goes, where if Asian Americans wait for our turn, it will never arrive. I mean, that, that's just the truth of it. Like, if we wait for someone to say, hey, it's like time for this person to run for president, like, don't hold your breath. <laughs> that's, that's not happening. Um, so it's going to have to be us putting ourselves forward. Oh, my God. has got me. No. <laughs> Sorry. That's, that's, anyway. So... So we're going to have to put ourselves forward and say, look, we have a vision for the country. We can contribute. We can lead at the very highest levels. Uh, and that's the only way we're going to, to take a, a true leadership position in this society. The second thing is that Asian Americans have been somewhat marginalized politically for a number of reasons. And I cannot tell you how grateful I am to all of you here because you're all trying to counteract that. But you all know you're going against the grain because Asian Americans do not see politics as like a natural realm for them or competition. They feel somewhat still like foreign. They don't think it matters. They don't think uh, political leaders care about them. Uh, and this election is an opportunity for us because we can actually, so uh, I was talking to, to 
uh, Sandy and some others. So California moved its voting date up um, where it is going to be the fifth state this time in the Democratic primary. So you have Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Nevada, and then California. And in a very, very diverse field, it is not going to be decided by California. So California, by the time you guys vote in the primaries traditionally, it doesn't matter, it's already over. But, but this time, it will not be over. This time, Asian Americans can actually help decide who's going to be the President of the United States. And if I'm still in that picture, I have a feeling I'm going to get a significant proportion of the Asian Americans of California, like we have a chance to make a real difference on the political level. And the third thing, and the sort of the most personal element of it, is that as an Asian American man, I have had this sense, and some of you may have this sense as well, that um, I'm allowed to become this successful, but I'm not allowed to become this successful. Uh, you know, and certainly that is true in the political realm. And that's what we have to change, really. Because like many of you, I have been with senators and presidents and governors and the rest of it, and have realized what you all have realized as well, which is that we are just as smart, just as good, just as patriotic, just as moral as any of them, and that we can lead at the very highest levels. And so running for president as a Chinese American, I, I'm very, very excited about the potential of the campaign to help further a vision of what we can be in this society, that we are just as American as anyone else. Uh, hi, Anthony. This is Peter Nguyen. Uh, I just want to add on what you say. Uh, uh, great to hear what you're saying, but to add on the question, too, is it's all about timing. So the question for 2020 is a time for us as an Asian American or Chinese or whichever to run for, or is it this country ready for it? Or is it this country maybe the, the sleeping giant, the Latino maybe the one that might try to go a uh, uh, female to be the president of this country? I mean, it's 2020 just around the corner. And then with ongoing relationship with China now, it might not help either. So I just wonder, is this, is this the right opportunity or should we wait or should we I heard what you're saying, but, you know, everything Again, man, if we waited for the stars to align and be like, oh, now it's time for Asian Americans, we, we wait for a long time. Uh, but but I, I will say, though, that I'm an entrepreneur and operator, and there are some key variables that, that will make me uh, a contender on that main debate stage. So imagine when the first Democratic primary debate takes place next summer. Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Andrew Yang. And imagine how much value that will have to our community. And the only thing standing between us right now and that happening is me getting 2% of Americans excited about the Freedom Dividend, which we can 100% do. And the, the key lever that's going to help us get there is the people of Iowa, because the national press turns to the people of Iowa to figure out who they like, who they're talking about. That's one reason why the fact that I've been invited to headline this progressive event at the end of this month is so enormous, because national press will be there. Now, I, I'm an operator, and so I've figured out some things I did not know ahead of time. What percent of Iowans do you think participated in the Democratic caucus in 2016? There are 3.1 million Iowans in the state. What percent do you think caucused uh, last time around? 20. Very reasonable. The real number is 5.6%. There are only 170,000 Iowans who caucused in the Democratic caucuses last time. And the reason for that is manifold. But the main reason is that caucusing requires showing up and publicly arguing with your neighbors about who to support. It is not you go in, you like put, do a ballot, you get a sticker, and you walk out 10 minutes later. It's you show up and say, hey, I'm Andrew Yang, because he's the only one who's talking about the fact that all of our stores are closing because of Amazon, and he wants to give us all $1,000 to rebuild our Main Street economy. You actually have to have that conversation with your neighbor. So uh, only 5.6% of Iowans participate in the Democratic caucus. So let's say that number goes from 170,000 to 200,000 in this cycle because of enthusiasm. How many Democrats do you think are going to run for president as a, um, this time? 20, 25, something along those lines. So here's the kicker. How many people do we need to get on the Andrew Yang bandwagon in Iowa for me to finish one, two, or three in Iowa if there are 200,000 caucus goers and 20 candidates? It's a math question. Come on. Come on, Asian American leaders. It's a... 
calculator. It's it's maybe thirty thousand, maybe thirty five thousand. Like you could win the whole thing on like fifteen percent. So if we go, like it's like the stars are aligning for someone like me to become president, truly, because you have a very very broken up field. I do not need to win fifty percent. I only need to win about fifteen percent. Can I get thirty thousand Iowans on board with the fact that they should get a thousand dollars a month and rebuild their Main Street economy? I, I can, and if there's a video that CC has watched. The reason I'm here is because CC watched this video. Where's CC? <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm here is that CC watched this video. So there's a video of me on YouTube right now, me speaking to a thousand Iowans, like talking about this stuff, and I got a standing ovation at the end, and then I get invited back to speak at this other thing. So I can get the thirty thousand Iowans. I can finish top three in Iowa. I can be front page news around the world, January 2020, where the Asian man who wanted to give everyone money is now on track to become president. Like that's all very, very achievable. So this is a long-winded way of answering when you say like, hey, is it our time? We can make it our time. I think I like that comment. This will make that time. Uh, my name is Andy, you're another brother, <laughs> yeah. and I have one comment and one uh, question. My comment is, uh, I think uh, six to eight years ago, when Obama came out run, majority of people think he does not, he did not have a chance, he went. So that's my comment. My question is, I checked some of the information about you, I checked uh, your uh, business card, I don't see your slogan there. You know Obama has changed uh, Donald Trump, no matter like or not, make American great. Yeah, yeah. So what's your slogan, what's your priority one? Yes, Stop. so we, we have two slogans. The first is build the future, and the second is humanity first. So those are the slogans that we've been going around with, and they've, they've both been working uh, very, very well in different, different parts of uh, the country. So that's what we're leading with, a vision for the future, and then an economy that puts people first. Um, Mr. Young, my name is YK. I ran for a little office in 2018 for city council. But one thing I would like to hear from you as a presidential candidate, yes, we can run the and win the primaries, but how, do you, how are you going to reach to the common man and win their vote and become our president in 2020? All right, so here's the path. It's so much fun. All right, so I finished top three in Iowa, front page news for a week. We get to New Hampshire, where I happen to go to high school, uh, which will help me a tiny bit. But if you look at their primary, it's an open primary, which means that independents and libertarians can participate in either one. Now, libertarians love the freedom dividend because it's the brainchild of a guy named Milton Friedman, who all libertarians idolize. Uh, and so the libert and libertarians are essentially the third party of New Hampshire. So if you can imagine the libertarians of New Hampshire, who are they going to uh, vote for? Like a lot of them are going to vote for me, and they're much more likely to vote in the Democratic primary than the Republican primary, because the Republican primary is just going to be Donald Trump squashing Jeff Flake. Like no one's going to care. So, it, so, it's going, so they're going to come my way. And then South Carolina uh, is, is someplace I believe I can compete, because African Americans actually really like the idea of the freedom dividend. Uh, and then... Nevada, California, I can do well. So first things first is try and win the nomination, but I have a real path there. Now let's say I become the nominee, then all I have to do to defeat Donald Trump is convince, let's call it five to 10% of his voters that I have their best interest at heart and I will do more for them. And I've been around the country and I've gotten dozens, hundreds of Trump supporters coming up to me saying, I voted for Donald Trump and I will vote for you because you're an outsider, you're telling the truth, you want to shake things up, you're an entrepreneur, like a lot of things I liked about Donald Trump, I like about you. And so I do not need to get 40, 50% of Trump voters to say that, I just need five to 10%. Because if you look at the, the constituencies, Hillary did win the popular vote by several million, um, and all we need to do is we need to get like a slice of Trump supporters uh, over to my camp. And a lot of the reason they liked Donald Trump was that he actually acknowledged the problems. And the, just the fact that I'm acknowledging the problem sets me apart from virtually all the other politicians who are running. Well, I guess wanted to um, kind of throw down a teaser for you. Uh, 
uh, not necessarily one that's trying to start a debate or anything. And, and that is um, Asian Americans, as far as I know, uh, are pretty pragmatic. Uh, we are not ideologue, we're not extremes. Yep. Uh, either you're Democrats or Republicans. So part of the of your campaign is to appeal to the Asian Americans. I know that's not the whole game. I'm trying to say that next year when Democrats start to field their candidates, many of those we know is who are going to run are pretty, pretty liberal. Um, and, and can you run a little bit from the middle? So you have something on the economy, on technology, and you're, and you're more moderate. You're, you're, you kind of stand alone away from that democratic crowded field where a lot of them are pretty, pretty liberal. Unsolicited advice. Oh, like that. That very, very naturally, I'm something of an independent. Uh, you know, again, just the fact that I've run a company uh, and sold it and started other businesses makes me somewhat unusual in the democratic field. Um, so the argument I'm making to many very liberal Democrats is that the freedom dividend would be a more effective means of improving the lives of the people that you care about than other things that we're talking about. Because let's say you care about women's rights. Getting $1,000 a month would enable hundreds of thousands of women to walk away from abusive relationships, like uh, either work or professional. But, you know, you put $1,000 in the hands of, of individuals, it's going to strengthen families, communities, and children. So I, I think I'm approaching the liberal priorities with like a different lens, um, but it's a lens that some people find to be like really refreshing and somewhat like new. I, I think if you look at it, like I don't actually fall cleanly into like a liberal or conservative camp. Someone called me the shuffler, where I have uh, ideas that will appeal to people on either side. But if you look at what's happening nationally, 28% of Americans identify as Democrats, 23% identify as Republicans, and 44% identify as like, independents. And I think that I naturally uh, am more aligned with like the giant middle um, than I am the democratic talking points of the last number of years. Um, because I think many Americans have sort of lost faith in many of the policies that Democrats have been putting forward. Hi, Andrew. I'm uh, Glenn Fuji with the Papa. And uh, I did watch the YouTube video as well. But uh, a simple question. I know we talk about the dividend uh, income. So, so your platform to try to simplify the explanation of how it will be paid through your campaign, how are you going to sell that to all the various groups to, to simplify the concept for them to understand? Yeah, so what I do is I, I talk about our history and how something very much similar to the Freedom Dividend passed the House of Representatives in 1971 under Richard Nixon, and that one state has been giving people a dividend for 36 years, and that state's Alaska where uh, they have the oil dividend where everyone in that state now gets between $1,000 and $2,000 a year. And so what I suggest to people is that technology is the oil of the 21st century and that we can do for the rest of the country what Alaska has done with oil. Now that's like the simplistic way of explaining it to people, but then they think, oh, okay, technology will pay for this. And then they like, get like okay, that makes sense because uh, they don't really think about like the, the numbers. Um, what, but then when I go to the tech CEOs, I say, look guys, the way we're going to pay for this is that right now the trap we're in is that the big winners from artificial intelligence and big data and autonomous vehicles are going to be Google, uh, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, like these trillion dollar tech companies that do not pay a lot of tax because they say it all went through Ireland or we didn't make any money this quarter and they just don't pay a lot of taxes, which is fine. I mean, that's what companies are supposed to do. Companies are supposed to minimize their tax burden. But it's going to end up causing massive problems because these companies are going to soak up more and more value even as the public sees less and less of it. So what I tell people is we need to join every other industrialized country in the world and have a value-added tax, which will then give the public a tiny slice of every Amazon transaction, every Google search. And because our economy is now so vast, even a moderate VAT at half the European level would generate enough money to give everyone $1,000 a month that would then end up getting plowed back into the economy anyway. Um, and then the tech people I talk to say that's a much better plan than like a robot tax or an AI tax or something that's specific yeah. to innovation because th the fact is I don't want to slow down innovation. Like we actually need more innovation to be able to improve people's lives. 
So that's the way I'm explaining it to the people on both sides. Yeah, every, certainly uh, every other um, major industrialized economy actually already has a VAT, like everyone in Europe, like uh, most of Asia. It's, it's the most effective tax. The fact that the U.S. doesn't have one is actually somewhat bizarre. Uh, and we need to move in that direction because over time, taxing labor gets dumber and dumber. Like, if anything, we should be trying to create more and more labor-type relationships and incentives. And the last thing you want to do is tax something you want more of. So over time, you should be trying to move things more and more towards uh, a VAT-type system and away from income taxes. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very common. And because it's so common, the great thing is all of our accounting firms already know how to do it because they're doing it for all of their multinationals in every other market. Okay, well, let's... Oh, SK, okay. <laughs> do you think there's enough money generated by your VAT um, to subsidize $1,000 per person over 18? Yeah, so there are four components to it. Number one is the VAT, which generates about $800 billion. Number two is existing welfare programs. Um, now, not all of it, but it does end up substituting and reducing the cost of it. So we spend about $800 billion on current welfare programs, and you can get maybe two-thirds of that um, that uh, ends up being redundant to the Freedom Dividend. Uh, and then the great thing is number three and four. So if you put $1,000 in the hands of an American consumer who right now cannot pay his or her bills, what are they going to do with that money? They're going to spend it on their, their bills and like car repairs and tutoring for their kids and uh, occasional night out. And all that money ends up growing the economy. It creates several million new jobs. It creates hundreds of thousands of new businesses. And it ends up increasing our tax revenues by about $500 billion which also then ends up paying for this thing. You get a, essentially a quarter of all of the money back in new revenue. And then the fourth thing, which is also really profound when you think about it, uh, we're going to save hundreds of billions on incarceration, homelessness services, health care, and emergency room health care, because if people have this money, they'll stay out of the ER as their primary care. Uh, there's one study that showed if you were to alleviate child poverty, you would in increase our GDP by $700 billion because of higher graduation rates, higher productivity, better health outcomes. The, the big problem in the U.S. right now is that, like how many of you have run a company, like, like me, you run a company, I guess the other sense. So when you run a company, CC, you like invest in your people all the time because you know they're going to be more productive and like, you know, going to end up uh, paying for themselves. But in the public sector, we try and avoid that at any, at any way we can. It's like everyone's a cost. We just have to avoid spending money on you. Um, but a prison guard in New Hampshire said something to me that was very true. He said, we should be paying people to stay out of jail because he sees how much money the prison system is wasting on incarcerating that person. Like, when, when we try and avoid, like, investing in people, we just end up paying for it anyway, but in much more dark, perverse, dysfunctional, oppressive ways. Whereas if we just invest in them, like, from the beginning, then you can keep them strong and functional and grow the economy. So the VAT itself does not pay for the freedom dividend, but the VAT plus existing welfare spending plus economic growth plus better outcomes and value creation will pay for uh, the freedom dividend. So I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here with you all. If you'd like to get involved and help, please do just reach out to me or my campaign manager. But my email is very easy to remember. It's just andrewyang at gmail. I beat all of the other Andrew Yangs to andrewyang at gmail. You can go to yang2020.com, um, reach out to me individually, because I need your help. I need the Asian American community to get behind me, to help us reach that potential and help get me on that main debate stage in seven months. So thank you all very, very much. Have a great rest of your day here.